Hello there, girls and boys, and welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm going to be showing you one of the newest additions to Logic Pro 11. This is coming in the form of Chroma Glow. And Chroma Glow is a very, very, I don't know if it's controversial, but uh, it was underwhelming uh, or it wasn't perceived in the best of uh, uh, lights by the Logic Pro audience once it got released. Not because it sucks, it's because uh, I think Apple didn't uh, promote this bad boy uh, the correct way and i think it's a very very great addition to the logic arsenal so if this is your jam let's get into it but before we go if this is your first in the channel i welcome you because in here i show you every single thing i do in order to create write produce and of course perform my music live because i know that making a living as a musician is not a dream it's a possibility and if i can do it of course you can do it with that being said let's get into it so welcome back girls and boys to Logic Pro 11. In front of us we got the product that I'm going to use to show you the uses and the applications that you can have for Chroma Glow inside of a mix. So let's do it. The first thing of course is going to have an idea of what kind of music we're going to be dealing with. So let me press play for you. Here we go. As you can hear, it's a very, very synthesizer heavy driven track. So let's uh, dissect the different elements of it. And we're going to be, be beginning by applying some of the Chroma Glow effect to the sound of my kick drum. So here we go. First, I'm going to insert on my kick drum the effect in question, which is going to be found on uh, distortion. And there is Chroma Glow. So let's begin by analyzing the interface itself. As you can tell, there's, there are very few elements and it's extremely purple. So, Chroma Glow is divided into five different uh, circuits or distortion circuits, if I am more precise. All of them have two variants and uh, they have different uh, functions or different fields to all of them. For example, RetroTube, it's gonna give you a, a more warm, yet a less hi-fi sound to the distortion. This is actually quite, quite cool for bass, in my opinion. Then you got uh, Modern, which is quite similar, but in this case, you're going to have a much more well-defined uh, high-end, which is giving you a more hi-fi sound, if you wish. Then you got Magnetic, which is, of course, mimicking the, uh, uh, the sound of a uh, magnetic uh, tape recorder. And also you got a Squeeze, which is a, fun, a very, very fun uh, take on a uh, different clipping circuits. And I assume that this is coming from uh, guitar, play, guitar pedals, uh, distortion circuits, more than that once we hit the Squeeze mode. And the last one is analog preamp, which it's a transistor based preamp. So uh, it could be like mimicking an Eve or a cell uh, preamp. So let's begin. I'm going to be applying this uh, bad boy to the kick drum, but I'm going to stick to a uh, modern tube. Let's see what kind of sound we get out of it. As soon as I started to crank up the drive feature, you started to hear not only the artifacts being created by the uh, harmonics, uh, coming from the distortion, but also the tone itself started to morph and it's giving us a more, how can I put it, uh, more uh, attack driven tone. That's actually cool. Now, I'm going to run you quite briefly through the architecture of the plugin itself. As I mentioned before, you got two different types or two different styles of distortion per model. Right now we're rocking clean. Let's try Colorful. Quite clearly, a much more aggressive take on distortion. Over here then, we move over to this section and we got a bypass filter. This is badass, especially for uh, this particular moment on which we're applying this to a low end driven instrument, such as the kick drum. What this guy does, it's gonna cut out the low end, of course, based on the frequency that we decided or we selected on the bypass selector, and it's gonna cut out those low frequencies from the distortion circuit. That means that low energy, since it, be, it tends to be quite, quite um, energetic or powerful, it will trigger the distortion circuit sooner and it, it will affect the way that our low end is perceived by our human ears. So by doing this, you get the good stuff out of the distortion 
particularly on the attack of the kick drum, without ruining the low end of it. Let's test it. Here we go. <laughs> Big difference, right? And now you start to see why would you use this bad boy. Then the next section is basically just an, an input and output uh, controller, which is what allows us to keep a proper and, and correct gain stage. In this case, for example, let's say that our kick drum is not hitting the circuit hard enough. I'm going to push it, let's say, 3 dBs, and I'm going to lower the drive all the way down, and you will see how much it's going to affect the sound. Here we go. much better. That's due to the fact that my kick drum is not uh, that loud, the recording is not that loud, and by the use of the level in, we're, uh, telling the, the, we're, we're increasing the input of the signal from my kick drum, uh, as seen by the distortion circuit of the plugin, uh, to be hotter. Therefore, we have to push way less the drive feature. That's actually very important, because that way you can avoid adding extra noise to your mix and stuff. Then the next one is clearly a, a level controller and a, an output, so we can actually have a proper comparison point when we bypass it, and a mix knob, which is quite cool, because that way we can do something stupid like this and see what happens. This is basically controlling the wet and dry. Wet stands for full-on effect and dry, no effect whatsoever. Here we go. Badass, right? Now the next section, and I think this is my favorite of the entirety of the plugin, is the low cut and high cut sections. Those are basically filters, okay? But those filters have a particular uh, shape to them, and you're not gonna use them uh, to filter, necessarily speaking, the the information or the frequencies that are gonna be fed or will be projected by the plugin itself. You're gonna use it to shape up the sound that you get out of the plugin. Let me explain. You can see over here that we got the slope, which is telling us, or telling the plugin, how intense the slope is going to be once the filter is applied and the cutoff is going to take place. Then we got the uh, frequency, which is clearly telling the, the cutoff uh, where to begin, and the resonance point. Let me bring the Humble EQ so you can see this in, in a much more visual, obviously, a much more uh, palpable fashion. What we're basically doing is this. In mind that we're rocking this, the filter over here in 160 something hertz, and right now you can tell that we're rocking at 12 dB per octave. If I go uh, as low as uh, our uh, chroma glow can go, which is 6 dB per octave, you can see that this loop is super soft. But the thing is this, remember that there is a resonant point. The resonant point could be uh, quite similar to what the the Q on the EQ is, is doing. Right now, since we have this super gentle slop, we're not seeing any, any form of uh, morphing on the shape of our filter. But see what happens if I change to a much more aggressive filter. Uh, uh. This thing is actually following the positioning of our uh, resonance point and, filter, uh, and cut point as well. So you can see already how much this is going to affect the shape of the information and the sound being outputted or being fed to the plugin itself. And I'm saying that because you can either go pre or post. Pre stands for the information before uh, being affected by the local before hitting the preamp, the, the preamp, the distortion, and post is after the distortion took place. Let's play around with it. Cool, right? 
it feels like the kick drum is becoming more, uh, how can I put it? It's more present in the mix already, and it feels like it's quasi EQ'd. And we're not necessarily EQing it, we're shaping up. And the way that I would use Chroma Glow, for example, would be having it uh, inserted as the first uh, plugin on, on my chain. So I develop a sound by adding the color that the distortion adds and, well, you know, bringing flavor to the whole thing. Now let's do the same on the bass. And I'm going to show you now how important the, the pre and post fader, pre and post uh, uh, low cut uh, actually is. Let me take you first to the bass. And it sounds like this. Okay, now let's insert a chroma glow. Insert. And for this, I'm gonna apply. Let's go for a squeeze. And I'm gonna go for hard press. No, let's keep it a soft press. Let's play around with it first, get familiar with the sound, and then I'm gonna begin a play around with low cut. Here we go. Much more interesting sounding, right? Impressive. Now, let's uh, solo once again the sound of our bass. I'm going to turn on the low cut, but this time around we're going to be applying the low cut as a post uh, a distortion effect. And again, the same principles applies. Since this is a low, uh, low frequency based instrument, I will have to play around with this. And my objective is going to be using the resonance point to increase the punchiness of my bass. Let's see if it works. Here we go. Insane, right? That was badass. And last but not least, let's do the same on the clap. And the clap is going to be very fun because in here we're going to be using a different circuit. Let's try a magnetic. And now you know what? Let's try a retro tube. And we're going to keep it clean. And let's see. I might increase the input a little bit because the, it's not super hot. Again, let's solo the sound of the claps. And so we can get familiar with the sound. Here we go. Very important to play around with the level output because otherwise you can be fooled by applying the distortion and the natural effect that it has. Well, it always increases the output of any signal the harder you hit the drive function. That's not exclusive to Chroma Glow, that happens to every other uh, distortion circuit or plugin. So you will have to always keep an eye on the output. Otherwise, you're gonna feel that everything sounds better as soon as you crank up the gain, because in reality, you're just making sound louder. So it's important to keep uh, an eye on the level. And as you can hear, we're starting to get more uh, extra harmonics, clearly, and the sound is becoming more uh, saturated in a very good fashion. I'm gonna bring back the rest of the mix and let's play around with the drive. Here we go! Very good, very good. Now, let's just, uh, as a final uh, showdown, let's turn off all of the different instances of Chroma Glow and compare the mix with and without. First, with it, without. Here we go.
So what do you think? I think the difference is quite well palpable. And again, this is just a brief showcase of the capabilities of the plugin. This is, in my opinion, far more than just a mere uh, distortion plugin. Uh, I can see why people would be a little bit uh, underwhelmed by Apple putting so much emphasis on a plugin such as this one, because uh, from from the surface level, it feels like it's just yet another e distortion uh, circuit. But I think after using it for a good while now, that this plugin and this has been quite honest. It's changing the way that I see the rest of my uh, distortion plugins for real because it behaves quite similar to some of the analog gear that I have access to here at the studio and it's very very good sounding which is what matters the most. I think that this guy it's actually requiring a lot of horsepower because I don't know if you could tell but every time that I bypass the plugin there is a little bit of a catch up if you know what I mean some form of latency at play uh, and I assume that this is because, and this might be uh, wrong, but correct me if I am wrong, of course, but I think uh, it has some of the AI stuff that Apple uh, promoted as well with the release of this uh, Logic 11 version. Yeah, Logic version 11, that sounds better. And uh, regardless of how it works, it's excellent. Uh, and I think it's a very, very good addition to the Logic Arsenal. I would use this bad boy on both scenarios, production and mixing. On mixing, you could see right now the potential. It's a very, very great way to shape and, and get your uh, sounds prepared for EQing and compression. Because by the nature of the, of the circuit itself, you are going to get some, uh, uh, some form of compression after the distortion takes place. And also, uh, the morphing capabilities that comes from the harmonics and the filters uh, inside of the plugin make turns it into a very good way for you to get your sounds prepared before hitting the mixing stage for serious mixing. Or let's say that you're working on a new track and there is something missing on the sound of your, of your bass. If I had this plugin when I was producing this track, I would have used it on the, on the bass, for real, because you saw how rich it became. The sound is much uh, deeper sounding and it had more, it developed a much more aggressive uh, tone to it, which fits the nature of the song quite nicely. This is a very good plugin, Garson Boys. And all in all, I recommend uh, you to get this new version of Logic and practice with these new tools. They are fantastic. If you got any more questions regarding this uh, particular plugin or anything related to Logic 11, please let me know in the comment section down below. And of course, if you want to support this channel and this kind of content, the best way to do it is by listening to music on Apple Music or Spotify, and also by following us on social media such as Instagram and X, because that's the best way for you to get in touch with us in a much more personal basis. Now, girls and boys, as every single time I meet you, I gotta remind you that you should never let anybody tell you what to dream about. Remember that I will see you when I see you.